today we're joined by Scott Hill. Scott Hill is a maths brain, genius, knowledge of physics, knowledge of law, knowledge of all of those wonderful things. And we're going to be discussing all things capitalism, late stage capitalism, criticisms, pros, cons, all that wonderful stuff. So Scott, thank you very much for joining me today. Thanks for having me, Ash. Uh, how are you enjoying late stage communism, uh, late stage capitalism, rather? <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's, uh, it's confusing um, because yeah. there's all, these, all these dichotomies everywhere. And just to stress to the audience, we're not criticizing capitalism. Uh, we're just maybe having some critiques around the edges. Um, you know, it's a, it's, it is a good system, but there's obviously some cons and we're starting to see them come through the cracks now. So I'll put the question to you, Scott. Are we in late stage capitalism? Uh, I think it's pretty clear that we are, uh, but I think it's really instructive to figure out exactly what Marx meant when he said late stage capitalism. So Marx's original ideas were that capitalism is a really fantastic system for generating wealth across a society, but the distribution is really lumpy. So you end up with very, very rich people and very, very poor people. And the core of Marx's idea was that capitalism by necessity reaches an end stage where you, you push harder and harder and harder to generate more wealth, but the amount of wealth that you generate gets less and less and less the harder you push. Uh, and at a certain stage, the poor people, the workers get fed up with it all, burn society down, redistribute all the wealth and start over. That's right. So Marx's crit critique of capitalism was, he was also critical of the booms and busts. And what we've seen since the year 2000, we've seen, you know, the dot com, we've seen the global financial crisis, and now we've seen the corona crisis as well. So he was also critical of, 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 of the booms. So there's two things to sort of unpack there. Why does, why in your opinion, does, do we, are, we, are we seeing these diminishing returns as time goes on? So I think there's two elements of it. I think the first one is the buildup of debt. So there's this concept called the long-term debt cycle, which, uh, and, and the business cycle really, which describes the booms and busts. So on a boom, you have uh, areas where you can build up debt in a society, put extra money into the community. Uh, that money flows around, generates wealth, generates production, and you get a boom. And then you reach critical mass of that debt where either the people or the corporations or whichever, whichever body in the society is accumulating this debt uh, no longer wishes or no longer is able to generate more debt. And you end up with a bust as these uh, entities that have built up too much debt either deleverage, pay off their debt or they go bankrupt. Um, now, those, that sort of describes the short-term business cycle, debt cycles. There's also about a 75 to 100 year long-term debt cycle that's been observed in capitalism. When you get to the end of that, it implies that there's no longer any place in your society. So rather than saying, uh, so the 90s, for example, that was a corporate, uh, corporate debt bubble, a uh, boom and bust cycle. So at the start of the, well, sort of in the mid eighties, I suppose, uh, corporations were the ones that were able to accumulate more debt and generate growth. So they accumulated a lot of debt. Then in the nineties, there was a big deleveraging of corporations. So that's a micro boom and bust uh, pattern within the long-term debt cycle. The implication of the end of the long-term debt cycle is that everyone in your society has either too much debt or as much debt as they can take. Uh, and basically you can't shove any more debt into the system without breaking it further. And, and more to the point, you put more debt into it and you get diminishing returns. So, I mean, we could issue an extra $10 trillion worth of debt to people uh, and we would see diminishing returns because all of that money would just go to service the debt. So one of the things that comes up <clears throat> a lot is that we've, we've, had, we've had the GFC, we've had the Corona crisis, we've had the dot com, um, all of the bears, all of the financial bears are, are always saying, this is it, this is the end of a long-term debt cycle. Um, you know, 
why haven't we seen the end of the long long term debt cycle yet? Is it just is it further on down the track? I think that what we've observed is that there's always been somewhere to find more debt issuance. So, you know, let's let's think about uh, think about the seventies, for example. There there needed to be more debt out there, and uh, Maggie Thatcher's policies took the working class that didn't have access to debt. Uh, and in America, credit cards were issued. So we had this huge uh, explosion in debt issuance. So up until now, there's always been somewhere to put the extra debt where it can be serviced, usually somewhere where it hasn't uh, already reached a saturation point. What the, what the bears perceive is this saturation of debt the issue that the bears always have is that they don't consider that you can usually find somewhere else to put some extra debt. So really, if you want to know if the bears are right, have a think about where the next big issuance of debt will go. And for the life of me, I can't figure out where it is. Well, if, if the recent policy announcements by uh, our federal and state government are the next issuance of debt are now the first time buyers, um, so they've been able to sort of kick that can down the road, it seems. Yeah, I mean, they're trying. Uh, that, uh, it's, it's, sound, it's a sound idea. They are the parts of the society that can take on more debt. Uh, the question is whether or not they can service it. So you can shove extra debt onto the first home buyers, but at the same time, you need uh, economic policies that will allow them to service it in the future. I think that's the issue that we've run into since the GFC is that we've, we've tried to fix the debt problem by issuing more debt, which is, you know, broadly the correct thing to do, but we haven't had, or we haven't been able to have the economic policies to allow the people that have taken on this new debt to service it. Uh, if you don't have wage growth, if you don't have new jobs, if you don't have thriving industry, if you don't have economic growth, then you can shove extra debt onto people, but they just default and it doesn't, it doesn't help, it doesn't solve the issue. So coming back to the late stage capitalism idea, I mean, one, one of, the, one of the, the things that Mark, that brought about Marx was obviously the industrial, um, the conditions that workers were in working in the factories, the lack of wage growth they saw then, um, you know, the, the perception of exploitation, you had riots, you had workers breaking machines. We're not seeing that yet though. Right. So, so, so is it maybe preemptive to call this late stage capitalism? Maybe we've got another, another leg of, of debt issuance to go before we start seeing that sort of thing. Why? And a sort of a, an adjunct question to that is why haven't we seen wage growth in your opinion? Some people say it's immigration. Some people say it's the debt load. Some people say it's lack of productive investment. The Georgists say it's because we've got too much rent seeking in the economy. In your opinion, why haven't we seen um, wage growth in the last decade? Yeah, I think that's the root of it. I think that um, uh, the neoliberal uh, ideology that uh, seems to me to have been quite the correct policy for Britain at the time, uh, it, looked to, it looks to me, having looked into it a bit more, that uh, Britain had too much currency on issue uh, and they needed to really, as, as they transitioned from being uh, the global reserve assets uh, issuer, to not being the global reserve asset issuer, they needed to suck out a lot of currency on issue really, really quickly. So the neoliberal uh, ideology worked quite well to maintain the stability of the country. It wasn't perfect, obviously, uh, and it probably could have uh, could have stopped pretty quickly as soon as they normalised their currency. But I think it was a real error to translate that to a generalized economic principle and particularly to translate it to America. So as soon as America took on neoliberal ideals, uh, we saw the end of wage growth, we saw the end of serviceable debt. Uh, and I think that's the part of the system that's broken. So, uh, so what is neoliberalism? What does it mean? So neoliberalism is, uh, Broadly speaking, Maggie Thatcher's set of policies that evolved over the years, Bill Clinton modified it quite a lot. Uh, but it's, it's basically a set of policies 
to try and redistribute the share of uh, wealth from production between capital investments and workers. So the idea that workers are getting paid too much and it makes your production unviable and unprofitable. So to try and alleviate that issue, remove some of the uh, some of the profits from production from the workers to the capital. So is that is that similar to this thing that you see on social media a lot, and it's a criticism of some of the Liberal Party's policies, is that the low wage growth and the, and 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 the, the the low wages is by design? Is that a neoliberal policy? Yes, okay. yes, absolutely. So it's it started off, I think, with reasonably good intentions uh, in Britain to try and reduce the currency supply, uh, and then we've seen sort of starting with Reagan, but really kicking into high gear with Clinton, uh, we saw the capitalist class uh, realise that they could make greater profits by undercutting wages. They, they are the ones that fund politics, so they just pushed and pushed and pushed with those sorts of policies. So, so the, is, is the immigration part of that or is the dissolving of... Of, of unions part of that or is it or, or is it, what are the what are the mechanisms that they use to try and keep wages down what, what do they what do they do i mean honestly i don't think immigration has a lot to do with it i think immigration particularly in australia is a growth mechanism uh so to replace uh to replace uh, the government putting extra currency on issue putting extra debt on issue the ability to put extra money into the system. Uh, if, you're, if you're running a government where putting extra money into the system is going to be detrimental to your political ideals, then there's only a few other ways you can get growth. One of them is to have immigration, uh, bring extra people in that bring their wealth and their wealth generation uh, capacity into the country and you get growth that way. But the other way is to sell commodities overseas and you essentially export your uh, responsibility to manage your economy by growing the amount of currency on issue. So that, so that's, so that's, that's, that's the, the whole free trade idea, right? So the, so the free trade idea is another neoliberal sort of policy. Yeah, absolutely. And so it's, it grows out of the idea that, um, uh, currency issuance and redistribu redistribution between the population. So essentially taxing the rich and giving subsidy to the poor uh, was a very poorly looked upon policy for a period in there in the 80s, uh, a very unpopular policy. So you, if you're politically unable to do those sorts of policies, uh, then you have to figure out some other way uh, to get growth and, and a great way to get growth is to have free trade. Um, Australia did it with uh, natural resources. America essentially just did it with money. They traded their money for other people's goods. Well, that's something you've, you've, you've touched on a lot throughout this first part of this conversation is you're saying currency in circulation, currency. Um, money from what I understand is just the substrate. So I spoke to Brian um, a week ago and money is essentially stored wealth. Right, but if you but if you're adding to the money supply, all you're doing is you're distributing the the purchasing power of that that stored wealth. So when you say money money supply expanding and contracting, sort of what's how do how do how do how do policymakers expand and contract the money supply? What do they do, and sort of what are the knock on effects of of that? Are we talking inflation, deflation, that sort of thing, or? Yeah, we've we've sort of had uh, about. 30 to 40 years of governments just completely abrogating their responsibility to manage the money supply. So the, the sort of classical design and idea behind money is that it serves the three functions, which I'm sure you and our listeners are, are aware of. It's a store of wealth. It's a um, means of exchange and, uh, unit, and of account. A unit of account. Yeah. Uh, we've focused on different, elements of that in different parts of the currency over the years. So at some points, the store of value is really important. Uh, at other points, 
the other elements are more important. The, the sort of ledger of account is really just a constant that just exists and it's very difficult to mess with. Uh, but you can sort of play off the other two against each other. You can, uh, you essentially end up with a situation where you have to choose whether you want your currency to be a store of value or a medium of exchange and where along that spectrum you want it to be. So when we have the gold standard, uh, it's a store of value. It's yeah. a store of value. Okay. Uh, when you want to maximize its utility as a medium of exchange, it loses that store of value. And we always see this when uh, over history, when the gold standard is adopted, that the gold standard is really good to have a backing to your currency, but the peg always breaks. There's never been a situation where uh, in all of human history where it's just been a constant store of value. And, and you can see the effects of this if you talk to wealthy people. I don't know anyone wealthy that says, you know what I do with my money? I get it a big pile of cash and I look at it. Scrooge McDuck sort of thing, you swim in it. and <laughs> Yeah, it's, it, it, no one does it. You probably don't even do that. I don't do that. Well, I've, I, don't, I haven't used cash in years. You know, the, no. the, the DFA uh, people are obviously concerned about the, uh, the, the, the war on cash and the going, going cashless, but I haven't had an, any notes in my wallet for five years. So what it sounds like is that it, when your civilization starts or when your currency starts, um, there, there are dials that the policymakers can adjust. So you've got, you've got the, the store of value dial and you've got the medium exchange dial. And what it sounds like to me is that throughout the duration of a civilization or throughout the duration of the currency, for some reason, the dial for the store of value gets dialed back and the dial for the medium exchange gets dialed up. Why, why are there forces that cause that to happen? It's basically savings, really. Uh, as your society progresses, uh, particularly capitalist societies, but it broadly works in, in basically every economic model that I've seen, uh, the people that are the most productive accumulate the most wealth and they store it in various in various ways so as they do that they suck uh the money out of the system essentially and put it into some form of savings so that wealth is no longer circulating it's no longer being used as a medium of exchange uh, and if your if your currency gets to the point where it's below the uh the level that your society requires the money to be circulating in the system, then you end up with currency crises, which I think is where we've been at since the GFC. But why hasn't it felt like a currency crisis? Why, what, why does everything seem perfectly normal? I mean, we've had a pandemic, we've had arguably employment go to double digits. I mean, why, 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 why aren't we in a depression right now? Well, I think we are. I think it's just a quiet depression and I think we can't quite put our finger on where the currency issue is. Uh, so national currencies, they're still broadly working quite well. Uh, but what we've seen is the flow of capital grind to a halt. Uh, we can observe this with China. China had uh, very rapid debt issuance, very uh, rapid growth, very good returns on capital and all the capital in the world. Well, I mean, in the abstract, a, a large part of the capital of the world flowed into China. Uh, so during that period, the, the flow of capital was functioning. And since the GFC, we've seen uh, debt issuance to companies drop and drop and drop and drop and drop. We've observed this in Australia. Uh, since the GFC, investment uh, activity has just fallen off a cliff and just why, continued why, to drop. Why do we see inc decreasing levels of business investment? I mean, I remember in the eighties and nineties, I, I was obviously a teenager then, but um, I knew people at school whose parents owned factories and, and offices and, and businesses, and they were comfortable borrowing millions of dollars and paying huge interest rates. Um, and, you know, they were investing in their businesses, you know, and, but, but now we've obviously got interest rates very, very low and we've got capital investment very, very low. Why aren't 
why aren't people investing? Why aren't people trying to build something out of this economy? Why are people just throwing it at housing? Like what's, what's going on there? I think it's a first mover problem. So yeah. if you, if you're a bank, you don't want to be the first person to put your capital out there as an investment because there's no, uh, the consumers don't have enough money to purchase whatever gets produced uh, on aggregate. That is uh, the, the investment will fail basically uh, if you're the first one out there. Uh, if, if you could somehow coordinate all the banks to put a whole heap of capital into the world all at once, that capital would go to wages, it would grow a consumer base, the money would start flowing. But because these are private entities and they're not allowed to make uh, bad decisions, they're not allowed to go out and expect to make a loss, none of them are basically allowed uh, to be that first mover that signals to the market, it's safe to invest, let's put our money out there. Why, why, why are they so reluctant now? Why were they first movers in the past? Well, let's have a let's have a think about what's changed in banking, particularly over the last, say, thirty to forty years. What? Uh, let me ask you this: What is the entity in banking that used to exist in the nineteen fifties and the nineteen sixties and doesn't exist now? No idea. <laughs> public banking. Okay. Right. So the role the role of the public bank is to be that first mover to make that loss and to signal to the rest of the market, we're going to back the economy and we're going to put our money out there. Once, once the banks see the government is going to back the economy, they can all go in because the government's essentially guaranteed them a return. Okay. So, so is this something that, that happens in, in, the, in the later stages of a civilization that you, you, get, you get the debasement of the currency, you get the... The, the bank's too scared to do anything. You get, you know, the, everything gets privatised, but pu the public purse socialises the losses. It, has this happened in history before? Yeah, this happens over and over again in history. In fact, this is uh, basically exactly the same situation that uh, Marx experienced as sort of a 20-year-old. Uh, he grew up experiencing the first ever uh, synthetic financial crisis. So up until that point in history, financial crises always came after big catastrophic events like famine, like war, uh, like natural disasters. And in those situations, you have a destruction of uh, the goods on supply. So you end up with too much money in the system chasing too few goods. Uh, what Marx experienced was the opposite of that. Uh, the Bank of England restricted the monetary supply by tightening up on banks issuing too much money. Uh, they messed around with their gold peg at the time, uh, and that uh, created a currency crisis, basically, a, a crisis of too little money rather than too much money. Uh, and it didn't... It, sorry, go ahead. Does that explain... That is, does, what part of that explains some of the, the riots and the the wage issues, is, is that what caused it? Because I thought it was just too much power, um, too much power in the hands of the capitalists. That's what Marx was critiquing. Well, that's one of the issues. So Marx, because this was the first time in history that this had happened, Marx was desperately grasping onto whatever he could figure out was causing this. And, and the obvious solution was all these capitalists have too much money. There's not enough money for us all these capitalists have too much money. The French uh, had the same issue. They decided that the corrupt king was the issue uh, and, and had a revolution against him. Um, if you don't have a good understanding of the monetary supply dynamics, which arguably we still don't now, uh, we did certainly didn't back in Marx's day. If you don't understand that money supply needs to expand and contract with the amount of demand in the system, then, and it's a very esoteric idea, so it's much easier to just blame the greedy capitalists. Well, that, well that's right. I mean, I, I um, started this journey on social media and Twitter, um, you know, only a year ago. And what I can see is I can see people that have been in the workforce and been in the economic discipline for decades, 
you know, some of them have been in the economic discipline for longer than I've been alive. And even they don't fully understand any of this. And that, that and that's why it's the, it, well, they, they do understand it, but, they, but there's, di there's differing ideas. Um, you know, that there's, there's no, there's no agreement. I mean, there's, there's, the, there's the group of people that think we're in deflation. There's a the group of people that think we're in stagflation, you know, there's, there's no consensus. Um, and, and these are, these are smart people. And, and that's sort of what makes conversations like this so important because, you know, we can sort of hypothesize all we like, you know, based on the, based on whatever opinions we choose, but, but how do, how do we know that, 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 that we're, that we're, that we're listening to people that have the right idea? How do we, how do we know? Is there a scientific test you can apply? Can you correlate it with something in history? Um, how, how do we know what, what we're conjecturing, what we're hypothesizing is right? Well, the, the issue that we've got is that we have a, a group of economists that grew up reading the books written in the 60s based on ideas from the 30s. Uh, and, it, and it hasn't really progressed from there. Milton Friedman is basically the, the father of uh, the modern uh, economic paradigm. And I, I don't want to say that he's wrong because I think a lot of what he said was really, really correct and right on the money. Uh, but he was a man for his time. He was in a period of uh, transition from one global currency to another. He was uh, a man for a time of inflation in the United States. He had a lot of really, really correct ideas. But his main idea was look at the money. He was all, he's a monetarist. He said, look at the money supply, fix the money supply, and everything else falls out from there. So what do you think is wrong with Australia's money supply? Do we have something wrong with our money supply? I think Australia's money supply is broadly okay uh, as a domestic entity. I think the issue is that countries no longer have domestic money supplies. I think we all exist within this global framework of, uh, of money supply and the, the point at which the money supply is broken is not in any one particular country. Uh, it's, it's in fact within the, the global distribution rails of the monetary supply. I think that the, basically the oil that makes the global capital flow uh, has been degraded and is dropping and dropping and dropping. And this is why it's really hard for the Americans to figure out what's wrong with their system and why in the global financial crisis, they had a quick look under the hood and they said, I have no idea what to do with this and hope that it would fix itself. Well, that, that, that's also the word that comes up on Twitter a lot, you know, when talking about these types of things uh, and on social media is the word Ponzi, this idea that, you have this system where you constantly need, you know, exponential intervention to make, to make it work. And then you look at all of these graphs that people share of the um, balance sheets of reserve banks. I think there was one for Canada as well. You just see these parabolic price movements, these parabolic number movements. Is, is, is that, that's a sign that things aren't, aren't working. Is it, that's a sign that the Ponzi, that, if, if this is a Ponzi, and I'm not saying it is or it isn't, because I don't know, and this is not financial advice, but are these sort of these are the cracks in the system that are that are emerging. Uh, it's definitely a symptom of of whatever is broken isn't getting fixed. Uh, if you need exponential intervention to paper over the problem, then you're not fixing the problem. So. Uh, so why don't we have any leadership on this from any policymakers worldwide? I mean, th these are smart people. Why, why aren't people address, are, are they addressing it? I mean, are they smart people? Um, I think we, I think globally we've gotten into the situation where we have politicians that are elected based on personality rather than uh, understanding of the nuts and bolts. And for most of the periods in a civilization's history, it is great to have, uh, high personality people as your leaders, but they need to listen to, to the experts that actually know what's going on under the hood. I think the problem that we've reached is that there's very few people under, uh, in the world that have a good understanding of what to do to fix the situation that we're in. Who do you, who do you think has a good understanding of the, of what, of the situation we're in? 
the the person that I'm uh, that I'm listening to a lot at the moment is Jeff Snyder. Okay. I think he's got a really good formulation of exactly what the problem is. The issue is that he'd be the first person to say, "I think I know what the problem is. I have absolutely no idea what the solution is." So, so what does he say the problem is? He says the problem is the uh, the money supply in the international banking system. And it's a very difficult problem to grab onto because the international banking system doesn't use the same money as you and I do. The money that you and I use is their stock and trade. Their currency is all of the debt issuance. So things like government bonds, corporate bonds. It's why heading up to the GFC and then after the GFC, we started seeing all these really ridiculous uh bond-like instruments, things like uh, collateralized mortgage obligations. Uh, since the GFC, they've decided to start doing collateralized uh, corporate debt. Um, things like EFTs, I suppose, can be used. But the issue is that the quality of this credit is dropping and less and less of it is acceptable as currency. So, so, we, we, so we, we, we're on the boat. Um, we've got our our, our 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 mortgages, and we've got our bank balance, and we've got our you know house and car and all that, and we're, that's that's the boat, right? That's rocking around. But then underneath, you know, you've got the derivatives, you've got the ETFs, you've got the bonds, you've got the uh, the collateralized whatever it is, you know, and they're 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 the whale underneath the surface that's kind of you know just sort of stalking you know stalking the world's monetary system. Is is that the Absolutely. And so there's been a few attempts to look at this system because it sort of sits outside of the regulation of any particular country. It sits outside of the purview of all the national uh, central banks. It, it, as, as far as I can tell, it looks like there's about $50 trillion in this system uh, and it's dropping and it's dropping quite quickly. Uh, the problem of being outside of the regulation and outside of the central banks is that even if a central bank decided that it had the firepower to do it, and it's not clear that they actually do have the firepower uh, to back up this system, even if they wanted to, they don't actually have direct contact with this system. They would need to give uh, whatever, whatever thing this system needs. They would need to give it first to their local banks and the local banks would need to transfer it into the global system. It's just, uh, we've essentially constructed this global capital network without any backer. So is that what's causing all of the problems we're seeing? Is that what's causing the, 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 the inequality, the, the lack of wage growth? Is this system sucking things into it like a black hole? Like what, what's hap how does that work? You know, like, yeah, like like I, 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 I go, go to work, I get paid for what I do. I come home and I, you know, spend money on, on rent and, and housing and, and, and food and all that sort of wonderful stuff. But how can, you know, what some billionaire currency trader across the other side of the world that's dealing in this, this, this alternative realm, how does, why does what they do affect me? What, so they're in charge of the deployment of capital, basically. During the, the neoliberal period, um, as we globalised the world, individual countries had less and less to do with the deployment of capital. So there was no, uh, there was no elasticity in the ability to deploy capital. This all works great and provides gigantic amounts of wealth and growth uh, as long as the growth continues, as soon as the growth stops, and if you can't find a new place to get growth, a guaranteed return, basically, uh, then we're all out of luck and we've got to sit around and wait for a government to, to stand up and say, I guarantee that my country will have growth by expanding my currency. Well, you can see it with this government. All they want to do is just pump money into housing. You know, so we can all just flip houses to each other and that's, there's your growth, you know? Yeah, I mean, that's, yeah, it kind of looks like growth a bit, maybe. Yeah, well, it results in, it, it results in inequality, really.
So, so that's, that's the issue, the deployment of capital. So this, this, this system that's beneath the surface of the waves has had grown in a measure of power over the last 30 or 40 years, and it wants to find growth. It can't find it. Um, and there's some mechanism and the, and the, on the ground because we're not deploying capital, uh, we're not getting productive investment, we're not getting um, you know, productivity increasing because that capital is not getting used because it just can't find any way to get it. Is that what's going on? Yeah. Uh, so as long as growth continues, uh, you can find useful places to put your capital basically wherever. Uh, if growth doesn't continue in a particular country, then the capital flows out of it and goes to find, goes to find growth somewhere else. Uh, this is what we observed with China. The Chinese government basically guaranteed the world that they would grow uh, and the capital got deployed there. And then as soon as, uh, as soon as the country could no longer guarantee the growth, the capital started flying out of it. Uh, and it's not clear to me which government is going to stand up and say, I will guarantee growth in my country. Okay, there's something you talked about when we spoke the other day. What is a change of trend versus a phase shift? So a change in trend would be if something's going down and then it slowly corrects to go up. Uh, so uh, I can't think of a particularly good okay. example. We, we, we don't tend to see it very often in, in a, uh, economics. What we tend to see is, is phase shifts. So, uh, think about uh, a blow off top in the stock market. You make more money in the stock market, you make more money, and then all of a sudden there's a change in sentiment. Uh, the bulls get spooked, they run away, and you have a phase shift. Instead of that exponential growth, it switches to negative sentiment, the bottom falls out, and we're, we're heading down. Okay. So most people watching this are undoubtedly probably between the ages of 25 to 35, right? When I, when I was that age, all I cared about was doing my job, um, partying on the weekend, finding a partner, um, you know, all of those wonderful things. I didn't think anything about economics. I didn't even know what the house that, that I was living in was worth. I, I, I didn't. I didn't pay any attention to interest rate movements or currency movements. There was a point, you know, in the two thousands when when we were at parity with the US dollar. It didn't make any difference to me. Why is everybody so obsessed with economics these days? Why is everybody following every single thing that the Reserve Bank does with a fine tooth comb? Why is there article after article about about different economic policies that, that the government's going to be? Pre proposing you know why why is there this focus on economics now I, I think it's a really astute observation when you were young the economy was working there was growth you didn't have to think about the economy you could just go out do a job start a business be productive and you would get rewarded for it since the gfc that's changed for young people you go out and get a job as a young person and you're rewarded with shrinking wages instead of growing wages. Uh, there's even quite a lot of, of professions, not so much professions, but things like gig work, uh, where you'll not only have declining wages over the first period of your working life, you'll actually dip into the negative in some situations. A lot of Uber drivers, uh, if they actually sat down and did the sums, would realise they're actually losing money uh, when they're working uh, through things like the, the degradation of their car, paying for fuel, depreciation. Uh, those, depreciation, those sorts of things. What we saw with the GFC was that whatever happened then caused this situation where we had, where it triggered massive intergenerational inequality, low wage growth for people, for young people, you know, forget about owning a house in the Anglosphere, right? Unless you're in a, you know, satellite city or something. Um, we're seeing the same playbook being undertaken by banks, central banks and financial institutions around the world to try and prop the system up. I mean, I suppose we've got that bastion of, 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 of help where we've got all these UBI like job keeper type payments. But if 
past history and past interventions from central banks are anything to go by. Are we headed for inequality on a scale we never thought imaginable? I think we're already there, to be honest. We're, we're at, uh, well, not so much in Australia. Australia is actually reasonably equal uh, compared to some of the really, really bad inequality places. Uh, America is the shining city on the hill for this. Um, America is currently at a, a, a wealth and income inequality level uh, compared to France before the first revolution. Um, just some of the most dire wealth inequality uh, situations we've seen in world history. Uh, I don't know that we're heading there. It's not clear to me that the society can actually sustain wealth inequality to that level. Once you start uh, telling big chunks of your population that they're not wealthy enough to eat or house themselves, things turn pretty grim pretty quickly. There has been an increase in America in alternative ideologies like communism, like Marxism, like socialism. You've got, you've got those, those images from unis where people are having rioting with, with hitting people over the head with bike locks. You've got this whole left versus right thing. You've got uh, social media is kicking people off who have right-wing beliefs and you're getting, you know, alternative media sites like Gab, you know, that's attracting people to the right of the spectrum. I mean, is, is, is this, this, this polarization, and this, this is a sign of growing inequality, isn't it? It's a sign of growing inequality. It's a sign that uh, a, a large chunk of the population quite rightly looks around and observes that it doesn't matter what uh, they go out and try to do, they can try and start a business, they can try and get a job. Uh, these things will not correct the problem within their society. Uh, so they go looking for other options. They turn to communism because that sounded like a good idea at one point. Uh, they decide to blame immigrants. Uh, society degrades, things get worse. You lose the quality of your, your workers, you lose the quality of your citizens, your society degrades and it's a one way street. Once you've broken your society, it's very difficult to put it back together again. Do you think we could, it's a bit, you're a bit you're sort of earlier on in the conversation, you sort of mentioned that maybe, maybe Australia is shielded from this for the time being. Um, but yet we've got this same issue. We're part of the global system. We've got, we've got our central bank competing against other central banks to keep the rates lower, to try and do whatever they're doing with the currency. You know, why, why it seems like, and it does seem like Australia is behind. I mean, behind the inequality of the other nations. So for example, you know, we've got the lowest home ownership rates in close, in close to a century. We haven't seen wage growth in, in, in decades. We've got We've, we've, we've got rising costs of living, childcare, you know, healthcare, all of those sorts of things. You know, are, is Australia headed in that direction? Do you think Australia will wind up America 2.0 in maybe 10, 20 years? I think Australia has always followed behind America and the UK uh, over its history by about 10 to 20 years. So I think that we're not there yet, uh, but I do think that we're making exactly the same mistakes uh, that the rest of the Western world is making. Uh, but because we're 10 to 20 years behind, I think we have a golden opportunity now uh, to have a look at what's down the line by having a look at the society that the UK has built, the society that the US has built, and decide whether or not we want to go down that path. So what is, what is so looking at all of the, the negatives that you're seeing in the, in the UK and the US, what is, what is in store for us if we keep, keep going down this path? If we keep going down this path, it's, it's obvious what the, the breaking case of emergency policies of, uh, of conservative governments are. It's import a bunch of cheap labour to try and prop up the profits of companies, uh, basically removing your own citizens from the productive workforce uh, because you've found some immigrants that will do that work for cheaper. Uh, it's things like uh, lowering taxes on corporations to try and boost up their profits uh, at the expense of having more money available to the government for redistributive policies. Uh, it's things like cutting social safety nets, uh, 
removing government systems that try and redistribute wealth within the society and prop up uh, the bottom rungs of your society. It's just, uh, you, you can see the, the symptoms of it starting to arise. Things like mental health issues, things like increasing suicides, things like increasing domestic violence. These are all symptoms of a society that's starting to fail uh, and the economic despair at the bottom rungs of your society. Some, some of my critics um, would say to me, if they were listening to this, they probably aren't, but uh, they would say that, look, we've got it pretty good here you know, we shouldn't be complaining. We shouldn't be talking about these issues because we've got beautiful beaches. You know, we've got, we do have extraordinary opportunities with, with, I mean, with the technology that we have, anyone can start a YouTube channel. Anyone, anyone can get their own only fans. Anyone, anyone can do, do Uber, even if it's, you know, as long as you're not overcapitalized on your car. I mean, there's so many opportunities to earn money and be productive. I mean, are, are we being a little bit negative, you know, talking about these things? We're definitely being a little bit negative. And I think the point is not that we're already at an absolute bottom of societal quality. It's that we're trending downwards and that's very alarming. You're right that there's more opportunities to earn money than ever before, but those opportunities are not growth opportunities. They're opportunities to eke out a meagre living uh, and eat ramen. You know, that makes sense. So, so that's, that's what one thing that, that sort of some of the trolls on Twitter and, and, and the people that like to shoot you down and conflate. And that is there's, there's two, uh, you know, you know this from maths, you know, you've got X and DX, right? So the X is still pretty good, right? Yeah. So, so, so we're, still, we're still up there with quality of life. You know, our, our, our level of inequality in Australia is, 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 is still very good. It's in the bottom half if you rank all the countries together. Um, but the DX is not looking good. <laughs> So, so the rate of change is starting to look very concerning and that's why we sort of have these sort of con conversations, you know. So, yeah, I, I, I see what you're saying. Yeah, absolutely. And the really alarming thing is not the rate of change, it's how much faster the rate of change is moving. Uh, and it's sort of, it's, it's an issue in societies that once you pass that threshold, once you have a tenth of your population homeless, it's really hard to fix that problem. It's much easier to stop getting to that issue, uh, getting to that state. That sort of reminds me of, of traffic theory, you know, flow collapse. You know, once you get a certain threshold, that's when the, 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 the flow starts to collapse. Yeah. Um, so we, if people are aware something's wrong. It's not just the community of, of bears on Twitter. It's, it's you know, friends that, are, that, are, that I have that are fairly well to do are complaining about all of these things as well. Um, there is an issue out there. Why is the quality of the public discourse ignoring all of these things? I think it's really hard to see under the hood of this stuff. It's not obvious which currency is collapsing and it's not obvious uh, how fast or where the problem is. We've, we've gotten into a situation where we're believing all of the people that are trying to paper over the cracks tell us that capitalism is still functioning as intended and a, a necessary requirement of capitalism is for us all to pretend like yes this works and yes let's keep doing it uh, so it's very difficult to see exactly where the problem is so if you don't know where the problem is it's very hard to, to grasp onto it and make any sort of sense you sort of are fumbling around in the dark that's that's pretty ironic because some of the some of the some of the things that the critiquers of of the of the late stage capitalism idea say is that the whole point of talking about late stage capitalism is to snuff that belief that you're talking about there to actually make it a self fulfilling prophecy. So it's just that's one of the counter arguments against the whole uh, late stage capitalism idea that I thought would be funny. To put yeah, in no, absolutely, absolutely, and that's one of the really scary things about these moments in history is that. We've seen over and over again, you can fix capitalism. It just takes redistributive wealth policies. Those are really hard to get to because it, it necessitates taking away some of the wealth that's been gained at the top end of your society and backfilling it in the bottom. You can do that in various ways. You don't necessarily have to tax, tax it out. You can inflate the currency and, and there's various ways to get there. Uh, but the point is that that redistribution has to happen at some point 
uh, not so much to stop your society to, from collapsing, but to reintroduce growth into your society. The longer that you sit around with no growth, the more people get discontented, the more that uh, communist ideas take hold because there doesn't seem to be an obvious solution within the capitalist system. One of the, one of the things that comes up a lot in conversations and look, and, and it came up the other day with, with Brian and it came up, you know, on Twitter a lot is this whole idea of the 1% and the 0.5% and the, and all that sort of stuff. And, and people sort of think that's the issue that there's this concentration of wealth. But if you look at, look at, look at, if you look at human history, the concentration of wealth has been far worse in the past than it is now. And, and that comes back to the whole capitalist argument um, that, you know, we do want to have a 1% because they, we get, we get iPhones, we get Zoom, we get Logitech cameras, we get all of these wonderful things. But in, in the States, Elon Musk wanting to set up a moon base. I mean, we've got all this cool stuff. We tolerate this, this wealth, in, you know, because we do get some benefit out of it. But there's, there's still this widespread discontent that this widespread blame that the 1% is, is, is the problem. I mean, are, are the 1% really the problem, do you think? I actually, I started off this year thinking the 1% were the problem. I think the 1% are a symptom. I don't think they're the cause. Uh, Winston Churchill said uh, towards the end of World War II that uh, capitalism distributes wealth unevenly, communism distributes poverty absolutely evenly. <laughs> Uh, I think it's a great way of, of pointing out the flaws in these systems. Um, you, you end up with a 1% that has all of the wealth and they're free to deploy that capital in whatever way they want to. What we're seeing is not an issue with the 1% having gathered all the wealth. What we're seeing is a lack of profitable ways to deploy that capital, which is that that's exactly what we're seeing with Elon Musk is that he's generated all this money he can't figure out anything to do with it so he's trying to send a rocket to mars well why why why, why do a lot of why is there so many you know wealthy people that aren't doing things like what elon musk is doing i mean are they putting it in a vault or you know doing the whole scrooge mcduck thing what's going on there is, is it just a personality thing I think there are a lot of people doing Elon Musk type things. I think that we're not as aware of some of the other ones. Uh, Peter Thiel, for example, Elon's uh, buddy over at the, the early days of PayPal, he's designing a lot of the surveillance systems for various governments. Um, you also see... It's a little uh, scary. Uh, yeah, yeah, very scary. But... Peter Thiel, if there was one billionaire that I would want to be doing this sort of stuff, it's probably Peter Thiel. Um, he seems like he has his head screwed on a little bit better than some of the other ones. I mean, I'd much rather than Jeff Bezos uh, designing all the surveillance systems. I think that's that's the real nightmare scenario. Well, he's, he's, that, Amazon's sort of become the whole... Um, the Karl Marx thing. I mean, that, that, that's, that's where you've got all of these protests and people sort of Jeff Bezos has sort of become the pariah for working conditions in factories. You know, this, is, is that a thing? Uh, it's absolutely a thing. Right at the side of the riots in America, uh, some of the protesters set up a guillotine out the front of Jeff Bezos' house. It's, it's subtle. That, yeah, it's subtle. Uh, that's where we are in America. Whether or not it's real, whether or not it keeps going, um, it's another question, but, you know, we're, we're close. Uh, but I don't think that Jeff Bezos is the problem. I think the lack of opportunity within the community is the problem. At the end of the day, that's a job for governments. They've got 0% bonds at the moment. The market is screaming out for government debt. And the only thing that we hear from our politicians is, oh, we can't take on more debt because we might not be able to pay it. If you grow your economy within your country, you will be able to pay down your debt. Well, I don't really have much faith in our political class. I mean, we, I mean, we, 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 the GFC, um, we had rates lowered substantially. We had enormous opportunity to use that money to invest in, in revitalising our manufacturing sector, um, you know, investing in, in, in training, upskilling technology. And we just got, we, all we did was, was blow it on, on housing on flipping houses to each other, right? And now we've got a housing affordability crisis in Sydney and, and, and 
perhaps Melbourne to a lesser extent. Um, and now we're doing the same thing again. You know, we've got rates close to zero and now they're trying, they're, they're, they're trying to get first home buyers in. They're trying to um, get people super, their retirement savings to go and bid up the cost of housing. I mean, really, I mean, there's absolutely no leadership from our political class for this um, to take advantage of these, these low rates. Why do you think that is? Why, why aren't we seeing any leadership in this country? They've, they've taught themselves that they're not allowed to make government investments. And, and to be fair, we voted for these policies. That's we had a, we had a choice, uh, during the, uh, the Bill Shorten election, he ran on a policy of, I'm going to make an electric car industry in this country. I'm going to, to start doing something about the environment. We had these policies on the table and we chose maybe a tax cut or just like the rich people get richer. I, I can't even recall what the Liberal Party policy was, but I don't remember it being uh, much more imaginative than uh, we'll just give you some extra tax cuts. Yeah, well, the, the, well, the, the thing is, I, th I think that the Liberal Party's the Liberal Party was basically a referendum on the Labor Party. So the Labor Party were basically, <laughs> we, we, the Labor Party were, pro were proposing policies that would get us off this housing nightmare, um, get us into, into renewables, get us into um, productive investment. And uh, it, it scared the living daylights out of people um, with all of the scare campaigns in the media that I've talked about many times, including on the public record. And, um, we, 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 and, and now we've, we, we vetoed that, that vision uh, by voting these people in. And of course, immediately that all they did was try and reinflate housing prices. Um, yeah. And it's, it's, it's very sad. So what can, what can we do as people, as individuals, as, 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 as minds or with our capital to try and help the situation, to try and make things better for the future and not, and reduce that DX, that, that, that acceleration towards inequality? As, as individuals, I think all that we can do is keep having the conversations. So, you know, these sorts of podcasts are great. Have the conversation, air it out. Let's talk about what's actually going on under the hood. I'm not saying I have all the right answers. I'm saying that the discussion needs to be happening. We can't just sleepwalk into, uh, we'll just pump housing prices and maybe everything will work out. It's not going to work out. We know this. We saw it happen in Ireland. We've seen it all around the world. You can't just pump housing prices and your economy fixes itself. Uh, it's more on a micro level. So that's sort of the community stuff that we can do, have the conversations with each other, uh, talk about the policies that we want to see in the future. As individuals, I think it's time to batten down the hatches, to be quite honest. I think if you've got a little bit of capital, um, find some investment that's going to shoot up, grow your capital a bit and wait for economic conditions to... to uh, improve so you can deploy it. And then when the government makes a credible uh, backing that they will cause economic growth to happen in the economy again, if you start seeing economic growth, deploy your capital, redeploy your capital, keep it in Australia, don't go overseas looking for opportunities. And of, and of course, uh, do that, get financial advice from a qualified financial uh, advisor as to how to deploy your capital properly. If you we need are, advice to deploying capital, I'm not the one to ask. Yeah, we're the last people to ask, I think. No, so. no. <laughs> and, it, and it was really just, it's a broad idea. Yeah, I'm, not I, I, I'm, not, I'm not telling you what, uh, what specifically to do. I'm just saying, as a philosophical point, try mm. to keep your capital in Australia if we've got economic growth. If we don't have economic growth. Another, another one, we'll buy Australian made. Yeah. Um, our treasurer is thinking of giving us all twenty-five dollar vouchers. Um, you know, give it to, give it to someone who's doing it rough. Um, yeah. And, and, and raise the bar, of, raise the level. Uh, learn, yeah. Listen to Jeff Snyder. And that's and that's another good point. The twenty-five dollar vouchers. If you don't need all the money that you've got, find someone within your in your network that's doing it rough and go and help them. That's what we did after World War Two. We came together as a community. We made sure people didn't fall off, uh, fall off the, the end of society. And we raised everybody up together by, by building stuff, by doing stuff, by generating economic growth domestically. We can do it. We've done it before. All right, Scott. Well, I'd like to thank you very much for coming on today and talking to me. It's been very enlightening. Um, and um, how do people find you? Uh, you can find me on Twitter, Scott Hill 222 
uh, that's probably the best, uh, the best one. But mostly I just rant and rave on Twitter on other people's threads. I've, I've seen it, you and Harold. <laughs> <laughs> Me and Harold going at it yeah, uh, and an avid commentator uh, always enjoys me putting in my two bits. Well, it's good fun. Anyway, thank you very much for your time today and have a, have a lovely remainder of your day. Thanks very much for having me. I should look forward to, uh, to talking to you in the future. Cool.